Okay, hello everyone. My name is Rob Canzanieri. I'm the virtual chapter leader for Data Architecture for uh, PASS. And um, this session is going to be recorded. Um, I, it's going to be at the Data, Data Architecture chapter at the PASS website under www.sqlpass.org, or you can go to my blog, which I have on the screen here, www.sqltigers.com, and uh, get information about this uh, recording. Um, today we have Phil, he's coming on and going to give us a presentation. I also have Tony. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about PASS right here really quick. Um, the summit, it's a big deal. Uh, it's coming up in October. Big event. Um, you know, you go there and meet a lot of people, see a lot of training. It's really amazing. I've been there once or twice and it, it was really great. Um, there's a discount code here. If you're going, you can use this discount code, and according to my document here, you'll have to, until July the 12th, you'll save $150 off the registration. And if we get enough people using this discount code, I was told, I think it's 10, I can raffle off a free summit event. So we'll see what happens. If we get 10 people using this code, I can raffle it off at one of our virtual chapters. Um. There's a lot of virtual chapters out there, and I highly encourage everyone to, uh, you know, check it out. I mean, we got database administration and science. I mean, er anything you can think of, and you just log into uh, www.sqlpass.org and sign up, and they have always have great events, free training to help you out. So with that, I'm gonna change the presentation over to. Phil. And Phil? Yes, sir. I'm going to let you take it from here. All right, we can do that. All right, so um, <clears throat> you guys should be able to see my screen now, and um, I'm uh, right there. <clears throat> yeah, I can see it. All right, perfect. So um, my name is Phil Hummel. Um, I'm a technical architect with EMC. Uh, we also have Tony O'Grady. Uh, Tony and I work together um, on uh, customer-facing presentations and solutions <clears throat> around SQL Server. I'm, a, I'm in a group called Microsoft Specialty Presales. Uh, before I came to EMC, I spent 10 years at Microsoft. Uh, I was a um, uh, consultant and a presales specialist for SQL Server. I did the um, I did the SQL Server Certified Masters program while I was at Microsoft. Uh, Paul Randall and Kimberly Tripp did a lot of the, taught, taught a lot of the sessions there, and people like Gert Drapers. And it was uh, six weeks. <clears throat> I didn't come home for six weeks. I stayed there and did the course, and um, it was it was one of the best things um, from a career and community standpoint I've ever done in my in my life. The the summit they don't do the they don't do the the certified master's program anymore. But the summit is the closest thing you can get to that kind of experience. So um, go out and, and and tell your boss it's it's seventeen hundred dollars plus a plane ticket and a couple nights in a hotel. It's the best investment that they'll make in their company uh, around um, building SQL skills <clears throat> that there is out there. All right, <clears throat> and Tony. Tony's going to pick up. Tony, you want to introduce yourself real quick now, and then and then we'll 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 roll on. Tony's on mute. Uh, sure. All sure. right. Yeah, you can hear me, Phil. Yep. Yes. Perfect. Thanks. Hi. Uh, yeah. Uh, hi. My name is uh, Tony O'Grady. Um, I work with Phil uh, doing customer facing presentations on occasion. Um, I'm aligned to the um, global solutions engineering team at EMC. Um, we write reference architectures and papers um, around technologies such as all flash arrays. Um, a bit like Phil as well, I also came from Microsoft to EMC where I worked in uh, Premier Field Engineering in the UK. Thanks, Phil. Cool. And where are you now, Tony? I am in Cork, Ireland. Perfect. <laughs> all right, let's get started. <clears throat> so. <clears throat> This is a this is a quote from a study. This isn't um, this isn't anything that um, this isn't anything this isn't a study that we did, but it's a um, it, it's a study that talks about um, what some of the challenges in IT management are today, and the two things that um, came out in this study and things that we want to address today 
are around uh, data environment performance and dealing with some of the operational complexity in um, in IT ownership. <clears throat> and so I, I too have a blog, I didn't list it on here, but the, the tagline of my blog is taking the complexity out of IT ownership. So <clears throat> how do we, over time, rather than add complexity, how do we improve operations and take complexity out? And, and so those are two of the aspects that of IT operations, performance and operational complexity that we want to matrix with this idea of all flash arrays and see how those um, interact. So <clears throat> why is managing performance so challenging? So the IO workloads that come from a SQL Server environment, when you mix OLTP and you mix OLAP and reporting workloads, you mix um, applications that have lots of very small transactions, you have applications that are more batch processing. The IO characteristics, when I look at what's coming at a, a storage device <clears throat> from the server, when we, when we look at the Windows counters and when we also look from the storage side at the I.O. patterns that are, that are coming at us, um, a couple of things stick out. One is there's a lot of different I.O. block sizes and patterns, and there's also a lot of spikiness to typical SQL Server workloads. And that spikiness comes because of checkpointing, and it also comes because of batch processing and the way people do business. <clears throat> and um, there was, a, there was a guy who worked at Microsoft who came from IBM, came from the storage side, <clears throat> and got involved in a lot of SQL Server performance things, and his comment was, who writes an application that, you know, like every minute dumps everything out of memory, you know? So he, he, found, he found that the, the checkpointing process in, in SQL Server from somebody coming from, from, a, from a disk storage background to be curious, but... Um, that's what we that's what we have and that's what we have to live with. So <clears throat> when you when you look at this this randomness coming not so much from one application but from all these mixed applications, um, the storage industry has made a lot of investments to try to deal with that complexity um, by what adding complexity on the storage side. So um, we we add tiers to our story. So we have a flash tier, a SATA tier, and a, and a nearline uh, 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 SAS tier, and a nearline SAS tier. And so, uh, and then we try to automatically move data between those tiers uh, in response to who's the most active. Uh, we do things with memory and front end ports to try to isolate more, more critical traffic from less critical traffic. So it's been good. I mean, there's been a lot of innovation in the marriage between SQL Server as an application platform and storage as a backend, there's been a lot of work that's gone into how do we optimize uh, technology uh, on both ends to, to make this marriage work better. But it does add complexity. And, and Tony's got a slide later on that's going to go into a little bit more uh, depth about um, what that looks like. <clears throat> So one of the things that we've seen, that I've seen a lot, and this was even before, before I left Microsoft, um, um, there was a, when PCI Flash was introduced into the market, um, there was a lot of hope that this was going to satisfy and, and eliminate a lot of the complexity that people were having to deal with around uh, centralized storage and performance. <clears throat> and so um, a couple of vendors became, you know, very popular very quickly and were selling lots of units in the SQL Server environment based on, on, um, on PCI Flash. And that did a lot <clears throat> to help performance for the applications that were on that, uh, on that particular server. But we also have all this complexity in, in our environments around 
uh, managing copies for what I call downstream environments, and that might be test dev or reporting. Um, there's a whole bunch of different uses for copies, database copies for other environments, and the process of getting that data from production to these other downstream environments can be more or less complicated, but it's very time consuming. I talk to many, many DBA groups who are very unhappy with the amount of time that they spend managing downstream environment refreshes. And so although <clears throat> server-side flash has done a lot to help performance of applications, it really doesn't do anything uh, for um, helping to manage downstream environments. So what I'm trying to what I'm trying to set up here is a little bit of the motivation of the problem that we're trying to solve. Performance, operational complexity, and the two <clears throat> can be linked, um, but we want to we want to we want to talk about solutions that can help us address both these problems. So <clears throat> this is a build slide that came out of the marketing, but I found it useful <clears throat> for two reasons. One, this box, and this doesn't this doesn't relate to just uh, all flash arrays. To me, an architecture wish list always includes scale out. I mean, <clears throat> we've seen um, over the years we've seen more and more movement, even in in immediate size and large enterprises, <clears throat> to try to follow the design and architecture patterns that we've seen the really big players like Amazon and Xbox Live and eBay and you know these kinds of internet scale companies have over time gone through their architectures and found any instance where they had to scale up and they've tried to find a solution where they can replace that with a scale out solution and so um, that's a that's a great architectural property, if you if you if you will, in evaluating technologies that can help you um, simplify your your operation and help with performance. So, um, if I have a technology and I can put in a single unit of technology um, with a certain amount of capacity and a certain amount of performance, if I can bring in a second unit of capacity, whether that be a web server or a storage device or whatever it is, if I can plug that into my infrastructure and non-disruptively add both performance and capacity to, uh, to whatever uh, tier in my application it is, that's a really good thing. So when you're looking for solutions in general, but especially storage solutions, all flash arrays, spinning media arrays, whatever, storage solutions. Um, <clears throat> look around at the things that offer you uh, seamless scale out. So in, in database applications, it's even more complicated. Web servers, it's a little bit easier to say, okay, so I bring in another web server, I update my load balancer, I put this behind the load balancer, and over time, the load balancer starts generating traffic, that's, that's great, so I handle more requests. On the data side, it's a little bit more challenging to say, I have data that lives on this one device, and when I put two devices in, I want that data to rebalance itself across the capacity, the total capacity that I have now, without taking any downtime. So look for that. I mean, there are, there are solutions in the marketplace that, that have that, both for all flash arrays and for uh, spinning media. So when you're looking for next-gen technologies to build your SQL Server and application architecture around, look for that. The other thing is, um, when you have um, point solutions like server-side flash, you will often find that the number of services, the data services that you get with point solutions tend to be uh, low. There doesn't tend to be a lot of things like uh, deduplication, compression, uh, redundancy, encryption, snapshotting. There, there are a lot of things that um, 
point solutions, especially server-side point solutions, uh, can help in certain dimensions, but there are a lot of other data services and things that, that you would like your architecture to be able to provide that you may not get. And even with, even with different products in the same space, um, these are the kind of dimensions that you want to check uh, between, between options that you have to see how they compare on, on, on these dimensions. And so what we're looking for by having a rich set of services and a seamless scale out platform is consistent and predictable performance. That's that's really what we're that's really what we're looking for. <clears throat> so I'm about I'm about two or three slides away from being done, then I'm gonna turn it over to uh, to Tony. So we lump the rest of this presentation. So that, that stuff was more motivation. What we've covered so far was more uh, kind of what's important, what are you looking for in, from an architect. If, if, you're, if your job title includes architect in the title, we know you don't write code anymore. So you sit around and, like me, um, you think about, you know, uh, how to apply technology to um, solve problems in the most elegant way possible, the least amount of technology and the least amount of complexity to get the job done. Elegant solutions. So, so that's kind of the motivation. We want to we want to address performance issues with these mixed workloads. We want to address complexity that comes from either adding complexity to handle mixed use workloads or from downstream environments. And now we're going to talk about all flash arrays and how that might uh, how we might do that. So. <clears throat> Robert, how are we doing on questions? Have we got anything yet? Um, I'm really not seeing any questions at this point. All right. Um, All right. So my fear I, I, is I you actually have all a, this. Sure. I have one quick question for you. If you sure. go back a slide, um, we um, we use um, snapshot for our databases to move them around. Yeah. And I noticed somewhere on this screen you you mentioned that, and yes. um, you said server. Uh, and I thought it was at the SAN level. Is there a difference? Um, yeah, there is a difference because <clears throat> you know if you if if you have a point solution, something that lives out of the server, and you can take a snapshot of a device that is known by that server, then you can use that snapshot to um, protect yourself against maybe logical data corruption or something else like that. So. You take a snapshot of a point solution, a server-side point solution, and it helps you with data protection, but you can't make that snapshot available to another host to do different kind of workloads. So that's where going from point solutions to a centralized storage solution and having snapshots available on a, uh, on a box that can have multiple hosts connected to it so that um, your production environment can be accessing uh, one copy of the data and you can then create a snapshot, present it to another host and have them have a writable copy for dev test QA without having to physically create a file and move it across the network and, and restore it to another place. That is a huge productivity gain for managing downstream environments. Okay. And and that's true regardless of whether it's an all flash array or any other kind of centralized storage device. It's just it's a it's a feature of 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 centralized storage that um, doesn't get leveraged enough. And part of the reason that it doesn't get leveraged enough is is that we're we're constantly educating the DBA community about how we can take application consistent snapshots on a centralized storage array and restore those to other environments without doing a lot of native SQL backup and restore kind of brute force copies. And uh, that's a that's a big part of my day-to-day -day job is talking to DBAs about that process. And, <clears throat> and I still hear even really sophisticated uh, SQL consultants, you know, um, say things like, oh, that, that sand magic where they make copies on the sand and, and people just don't, um, don't understand it well enough and what you don't understand you don't want to rely on. So um, 
Um, if you're if you're looking for ways to simplify your um, your environment, um, uh, there is complexity with having centralized storage because you got to know the product, but there also is opportunity for complexity reduction. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, thank you. All right. So <clears throat> we put these slides in because I don't know what the perception in the market is today about the reliability of solid state storage devices. And so we decided to throw a couple of slides in here to address the issue of reliability in case there's still some concerns out there about uh, that as an, as, as an, as an issue. Yeah. <clears throat> so a lot of work has been done. Everybody working in the, in the flash market, uh, server side flash, flash arrays, you know, all, the, the whole industry has put an incredible amount of time into engineering and intellectual property that extends the life of, of flash devices, shortens the mean time between failures by um, understanding the properties of flash and using it in a way that um, um, that prolongs the life. So we 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 probably have all heard about the issue that flash devices have a lifetime of a, an update lifetime. You can you can you can you can write to um, cells in a flash array so many times. And so what what the industry has focused on is <clears throat> how do I level those writes across all the cells in my in my flash storage um, unit to be able to um, not have any cells that wear out more quickly than the rest. So <clears throat> what we're what we're looking for is kind of wear leveling and write leveling. So these are some tests that 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 EMC did with flash devices, and I I apologize. There's a little bit of product stuff in there. I tried to stay away from product as much as I could, but I wanted to put this slide up because um, when, you're, when you're evaluating flash devices, whether they be flash cards or flash storage arrays or whatever, um, make, sure that your, make sure that your vendor and the, and the technologies you look at, make sure you understand what they do and, and get data on <clears throat> how they write to the flash array and um, um, how well their their uh, their right leveling works. So <clears throat> this is kind of a this is a little bit of a plug here, but I, I wanted to bring up the point of we've gotten really good at this. So if if you have concerns about reliability of of flash, I'm trying to address that and say it. Um, we kind of understand it, and, and and we have good algorithms and and software for managing it. <clears throat> the other thing is is evenly is being able to distribute um, data evenly across the devices so these two things are kind of related so that <clears throat> the um, if you if you think of these flash devices flash cards flash arrays as being a whole bunch of different um, cells or storage points so <clears throat> um, chips if you will so I have a whole bunch of chips and I've kind of aggregated them together. And then when I write data to it, I don't want to fill up one chip and not others because then that gets to the issue of uneven wear leveling. So <clears throat> look at look at an array that is close to, you know, three quarters of the way full or something like that and get an idea of how well balanced the um, the data is striped across everything in that array. That's also going to give you a, a really good indication about whether um, the um, the engineering is in place to to make this a reliable uh, technology or not. All right, where are we? Yeah. So before we move on, um, I was wondering, are you going to talk about the uh, technology around uh, sing, sing, single instance storage? So. Uh, I mean, one one of the other things with all flash arrays is it, you, you got to think about and look at is is your array smart enough that it will actually check first to see if it has a block written 
to storage that, that um, that's already there so that maybe it doesn't need to write it again. You know, some intelligence built around the fact that, of minimizing the amount of writes it has to do by having deduplication in there and, and by having um, <laughs> compression in there. Uh, so actually, <laughs> Actually, dedupe and compression is is in your part, and I think I'm I think I'm almost done. I think I'm about ready to hand the uh, hand the um, okay. hand the talking over to you. So, um, you want to you want to look at the next slide here? Uh, I think the next slide is yours, is it? Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Cool. <clears throat> so we're still on Im improved. Uh, uh, Efficiency. This is just kind of a. This is this is a. Um, this is a summary of um, uh, some of the some of the features that you look for and and how these things um, how these things relate specifically to efficiency. So um, protection overhead. So we say an an array or a storage device is more efficient if you can get good protect uh, good protection with less overhead. So mirroring is is great protection but it has high overhead and so you know even in even in these devices the the designers of these devices still have to think about raid concepts even though for end users you typically don't have to to choose usually the decisions are made for you by uh, whoever designed the device <clears throat> but when you're looking for devices you should compare um, how protection has been implemented and and what it leaves you in terms of usable capacity. Um, from an allocation standpoint, thin provisioning. <clears throat> this is this is the ability to um, protect yourself from over allocation based upon projections that may be unrealistic. So the DBAs go to the storage guys and say, "Oh, this is going to be a." huge application. I need five terabytes of storage for this. Uh, let's allocate all that uh, up front because I don't want to take um, I don't want to take the risk of having to grow my devices and and um, 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 manage change uh, as we grow these devices. So let's let's allocate five terabytes. Most devices, a lot of devices use what's called thin provisioning so that um, the people who manage the storage can create a device that looks to Windows to be a five terabyte device, but actually um, <clears throat> uh, the the storage device will, as you write to it, it will allocate more space. So you can take a, a 20 terabyte device and you can allocate 40, 60 terabytes worth of space on it, um, and um, Windows still sees all that, but it 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 only allocates it only allocates physical storage as you use it. <clears throat> uh, compression. Um, so uh, <clears throat> the ability to look for patterns in the data that allow um, the storage array to reduce the um, footprint from storage, and we see this <clears throat> we see this with um, SQL Server compression as well, and and I think I'm, I <clears throat> there's a slide later on that talks about uh, specifically about what happens in the event that um, we mix and match. So SQL Server knows how to compress data. Uh, some storage devices know how to compress data. All flash arrays, non-all flash arrays. There's a lot of storage devices out there that try to compress data, but the challenge for your you as an architect is to understand one, should I use one or both compression levels? If I do try to use both, how does the compression algorithm on the on the array side deal with already compressed data? So these are these are comparisons and things that you should think about both in terms of how much capacity do I need to buy and also how efficient is the combination of the storage device that I'm that I'm purchasing and the native features of SQL Server, uh, how well do they interplay? <clears throat> and then uh, deduplication and snapshots in the in the area of SQL Server. Um, um, uh, one of the places where we've seen a huge increase in popularity is around uh, always on availability groups. And the use of um, read-only 
uh, uh, database replicas um, for managing some of these use cases around downstream environments. So the ability to have near real-time reporting off of a read-only secondary replica is a really nice feature. Um, there are there are no technologies that I'm aware of at the storage level that use um, that have the same low latency near time reporting as an always on availability group does. <clears throat> everything everything we do at the storage level is always based on uh, copies or snapshots, and so there's always a uh, a lag and a refresh time associated with that to get my reporting copy. Uh, the lowest lag in data update that you can have today as far as I know is always on availability group secondary read-only copies. So when you make those copies it would be nice to not have to allocate storage for a full copy of, of the secondary replica. If you do those secondary replicas on a central storage device that understands deduplication, you can get a lot of savings. So you can still have the you can still have the best, um, uh, the lowest latency of updates for reporting, but you can also reduce the footprint of um, of storage as opposed to having point solutions with multiple SQL servers replicating over the network to different storage devices and then you have 100% full copy of that data every place where you have a replica. So you got a 5 terabyte database, you got three copies of it, you're using up 15 terabytes of storage. If you can if you keep some of those copies on a device that dedupes, you can reduce that. All right. <clears throat> we, we have two questions here if you want Perfect. to take a break. Sure. Um, once actually for me, um, the, the video is going to be on YouTube and we have a link we put on SQL, uh, SQL, I mean, um, the data architecture chapter for pass and my blog will have one, uh, SQL tigers. And the other question is about, um, they would like to know a little bit more about the difference between thin provisioning, writable copies and snapshots from a DBA perspective. Okay, so thin provisioning is a decision that I make with the first devices that I that I allocate for storage. So before I even talk about copies, which involve snapshots or deduplication, the first thing I have to decide is I have a storage device. It has a certain amount of physical capacity, and my SQL DBA wants some storage for for a database. So. I can allocate physical storage equal to what the DBA is projecting they're going to need for that for that device at the time I create the um, at the time I create the, the the storage device or the volume on on the storage side. That's what we call thick provisioning. So I allocate the full physical space for for this volume that I'm going to present the windows at the time I create it. Thin provisioning says and depending upon the, the depending upon the storage platform, there's more or less flexibility. But in this in the simplest case, thin provisioning says only allocate a very small amount of physical capacity. Go ahead and and reserve space on the storage device for the full amount, the one terabyte LUN that my that my DBA is 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 asking for. So I keep track of I keep track of the requested allocations so I know what the what the ratio of what I've allocated to what I've actually physical use, physically used is but I present this volume up to Windows when Windows looks at that volume it says oh that's a that's a 1 terabyte device I may have only consumed a couple of gigabytes of physical space on the storage device but Windows looks at that and says oh I have a 1 terabyte LUN I can create objects on it. I can, you know, um, you know, I can do whatever I want to with with up to one terabyte of space. Now there's there's some complexity and there's some interaction between 
how SQL Server creates files, whether you're using instant file initialization or not, that, and whether if you don't use instant file initialization and you create these big zero dot devices, then what does the can the can the storage device look at that and say, oh, that's all zeros. I don't really have to allocate all that. So there there's some there's some there's some nuances there to the features that you have on your storage and and how you set up your files on SQL Server. There's a bunch of blogs out there. I'm not gonna I, I'm not gonna uh, do a full discussion of that. Um, um, uh, you can ping Robert or I on the back end if you need more. So, so that's the initial creation. Then the next thing is now I have these devices and I'm writing data to it, um, and I want to make copies of it. So, if I make, if I, if I snapshots are the storage arrays capability of saying, create an alternative device that looks, that has pointers to the original. Um, storage volume so everything that's on the storage the original storage volume I see that on my snapshots and then anytime I change data on my original then make a copy of the old data somehow so that I keep a point in time vision of what that device looked like at the time I created the snapshot and then I can present that up to another application another SQL server and do things with it if I use if I use SQL replication always on replication to create replica copies. Now I have essentially multiple devices that are have largely the same data. Deduplication would be able to look at those two devices that SQL is replicating between and say, oh wait a second, this part of the database and this part of the database are exactly the same. They're stored on, on this on this section of storage. I don't really need to store two of those. I'm only going to store one, and then both both volumes will both point to the one storage location where that piece of data is. That's deduplication. So, Tony, I'm going to let you I'm going to let you talk about this slide from um, from a snapshot uh, perspective, and then maybe you want to say something else about dedupe as well. Thanks, Phil. Yeah. Um... Let me just cover off the dedupe one before I, I get into the into this slide in detail. Um, when we talked about reliability earlier, one of the advantages that dedupe also gives you is that because it's only writing once to the actual physical storage, you're also minimizing the number of times you have to write to that physical storage, so therefore prolonging the life of the SSDs even further. So again. Uh, an important technology there in terms of reliability, not just in, in terms of uh, saving you capacity. So um, this, uh, this diagram or this chart here, um, this is, um, uh, was, uh, came out of some testing that we did in our lab. Um, and basically, we set, we set up an environment in our lab uh, with a SQL Server uh, production databases. Um, we presented about, and if you look at that that middle um, that middle chart there, or that, that <coughs> we presented about uh, 20 terabytes of um, storage to Windows. Um, that would have consisted of our SQL Server database files and our log files. Um, that would have consumed less space on the physical storage because, again, because of the inline deduplication and because of the inline compression, um, <coughs> and also because of the sense of visioning. Um, we then went and we created snapshots of all these databases. So we created five sets of snapshots of all our production databases. So that meant, in effect, that we were presenting over 100 terabytes of storage into our Windows volumes. So that's a lot of storage to be presenting into your Windows volumes. But because these all flash arrays are really smart, this occupied very little space on the physical space on the array, at least initially. At least initially, it was less than 1% of the, of the space that was actually, if you went into Windows and looked at how much capacity all these snapshots were using, uh, the actual physical space used on the storage was less than 1% of that. Um, again, these snapshots, uh, think about why they might be used. So they might be used for dev tests. Um, you might want to uh, use them to offload some data processing. Uh, you might be trying to recover from data corruption. 
so a lot of the time they might be used for, for weed intensive workloads. So, so um, <clears throat> and as long as uh, you know you're, you're managing them and keeping them refreshed, they, they won't use that, that much space in your array over time uh, if, if you keep them well managed. But <clears throat> that, that's um, that's one of the, that's one of the real advantages of, of of these really smart modern arrays is that they because they, we come to recognize the fact that customers have a lot of redundant data out there, um, they, as I said, data, the individual databases will get repurposed all the time for various different scenarios. Uh, and you really, because that data is the same, you really don't want to be suffering a storage penalty uh, for storing it when you don't have to. And you still obviously want to be getting that, that performance, that consistent performance. You want to be able to say, I'm getting this consistent performance in production, if I take that out of production and take that into test dev, and I go and test something, I want to have the exact same performance because it's on the exact same storage. So I can be confident that if I test something and then move it back into production, that I, I have tested like for like performance and I know exactly what I'm going to get, reducing risk. Thanks, Doug. Can we move on to that? So if you've still got the ball, can you move on to the next slide for me, please? I'm trying. Okay. Uh, my slides aren't advancing. Oh. Ah. Is that it? Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. So uh, we talked about um, <coughs> various types of compression earlier. So um, <coughs> so you have uh, all, all flash arrays. Um, <coughs> typically, uh, in, in our case, uh, when we were doing some testing, these arrays, the um, compression was always on. So when the data gets sent down to disk, before it actually written to disk, before it actually touches physical storage, um, the data gets compressed. Um, so it, what an interesting case study we had was to, um, I think we have to last the slide again. What an interesting case study we had was to see, okay, so you've got uh, compression and deduplication. Uh, SQL Server's got compression. So how do these two technologies work together? Is there an impact on performance? Um, so what we did was uh, we set up our databases, again, our production databases. Um, we took a baseline test. So we wanted to see what sort of sub second latency performance we were getting. Um, then we implemented the two types of SQL compression. First we implemented rule compression, and then we implemented page compression. Um, and uh, we repeated that same test that we used for our baseline test. Uh, to make sure that we were still getting that consistent performance. And also, obviously, we um, <coughs> evaluated the space savings. Uh, did did the, the physical capacity go down with SQL rule and page compression? And in each case, yes, it did. Hey, uh, so Phil, the uh, slides are after. your screens are uh, up. Somehow we lost, it's on screen number two. We're on number 11. Yeah. All right, thank you. Sorry, I don't know what happened. Sorry, thanks, Bill. Um, so you can see here, these were the performance we got, from performance results we got from testing this in our lab. So we, uh, once we tested this, uh, in each case, the, uh, the latency remained sub millisecond for our, uh, this was an OLTP database, by the way, that we tested. SQL Server OLTP database workload, um, and for both, um, <coughs> so with the baseline test, with the row compression, with page compression, um, in, in all cases, uh, we saw very little change in performance. Um, and even after we ran a shrink file operation, so obviously this did not have an effect on the, the array, but we were able to um, reclaim some space in, 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 in the Windows volume um, but after, even after running the shrink file operation, we didn't see any um, impact on performance for this workload that we were testing. Um, even, even though there was a lot of fragmentation there, um, because the, the old flash array uh, is, is, is actually quite good at, um, <coughs> at um, delivering a, a consistent performance even when your data is fragmented. Uh, during this test here, as you can see in, in the results, 
um, even after running the shrink file operation, the latency remained quite low. So this, this gives you a lot of flexibility and a lot of things to test. Um, again, uh, it, 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 was, it was really good to see that uh, the, the technologies complemented each other. So both the row and page compression um, continued to save you space even after, uh, with, uh, even on top of the um, array compression. And, and, and again, the, the flexibility was there if you were running charter space, uh, we ran the, the shrink file operation. Uh, and it's, in our case, it, it didn't hurt performance. We have a question here. Um, the, the question is, um, doing compression in SQL Server keeps the compressed pages in the buffer pool and requires less memory, but and, well, actually, and less disk reads. How does that compare to AFA compression? Uh, so on the all flash array, it's a good question actually, thank you. Um, on the all flash array, um, the pages are compressed uh, on the array. So the page is sent down uncompressed and it's then compressed on the array. So you don't have the CPU penalty that you may have with say SQL compression because SQL has to compress and decompress the pages in memory uh, on, on the host obviously. So there is a, a CPU. Um, <clears throat> overhead there, so it does have to contend, uh, your OTP workload will have to contend for, with, for CPU cycles um, with SQL compression. Um, with all flash array compression, you, you, don't, you don't have this issue because the, the compression is, is done within the, uh, within the uh, controller in the array itself, so it's the array's controllers, it's the array's, um, it's the array's processors that are doing the compression so um, it's offloaded, and there's no impact on the production workload. Okay. Okay. Um, this 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 chart here is just um, an example of um, <clears throat> the flexibility and the power, really, of all flash arrays. And um, you can easily um, <clears throat> consolidate your OLTP production workloads, your data warehousing workloads, uh, your test and devs uh, within that scale outable uh, all flash array solution. So remember, this, this is a scale outable solution. Um, and you, you, you can mix and match these workloads to meet your business requirements on, those, on these type of arrays. Um, and again, you get all the extra features here of being able to. Um, take snapshots of your different databases and repurpose them for, for different requirements. Uh, so again, if you wanted to repurpose your OLTP database, offload some reporting to a different server, again, you can do that um, without, without, without the storage penalty. Um, and again, you can, you can have those multiple copies for, for test and dev. So um, <coughs> maybe after one production database, um, you can repurpose that for, for maybe some offload for some reporting and then repurpose it again for uh, te some, some test and dev initiatives. And again, you, you're getting that consistent performance all the time and you have the advantage of being able to do your test dev on like for like hardware at, at the array level. So you can be confident that you get the same performance in production. Okay. Any advance on there, Phil? Phil? Oh, we lost. Hello? You got it? Uh, no, it's after. It actually, I think we lost you. Let's let me put the present it present it back to you, Phil. No, we lost your connection. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you. Um. Can you give me the ball? Is it possible? Do you want to pass it back to me, Phil, and I'll try passing it back to you? All right. So let me send it back to you. Okay. Let's see if it comes up. There we go. We're back. Yep. Good stuff. Okay, so we're on slide 13. Okay, so um, this chart, again taken from some testing we did in our lab, um, it demonstrates 
SQL Server's overall performance and scalability, servicing OTP workloads with varying workload I.O. profiles that we talked about earlier. Um, this, this diagram really demonstrates um, how, how the, um, <coughs> the OTP performance um, of the whole environment uh, so when we when we when we push when we really push these all flash arrays, um, we can see how once we pat, we push it up past uh, maybe one uh, two hundred thousand IOPS, three hundred thousand IOPS, we're still maintaining that sub millisecond latency. So we get that consistent latency when we scale up multiple databases for multiple different workload scenarios. Uh, uh, we we still maintain that that sub sub millisecond latency uh, right up to. Um, 300,000 IOPS. This was at, on, on the array level. Um, obviously, the, the, at the host level, I, I, I think it averaged from less than a millisecond up to about a millisecond and a half. But really, it shows the real power of these arrays to uh, scale up and scale out um, as you add more and more workload on. Um, and again, these were SQL Server, primarily SQL Server or OTP workloads, but <coughs> all sorts of varying types of IO profiles. So there were different types of um, read-write ratios. And you can see it literally delivered increased SQL Server transactions um, because it was maintaining that sub millisecond latency when we tested this workload. Okay, can we move on to the next? Before we run, can we move on to the next? Oh, sorry. You, okay, do you have the next slide? Yeah, I do. Perfect. Thank you, Phil. Um, so these are these are cloud tags uh, that I put together, um, and for me they represent what we used to do in the past and what we do now with all flash arrays. So one of the main advantages of all flash arrays is that they're much much simpler, much much easier to provision. Someone like me coming in as a as a DBA, uh, I just found it so easy to set up these arrays. Um, the provision storage and to get that really, really consistent uh, sub millisecond performance, uh, really, really easy. I mean, that was that was one of the uh, things that amazed me about these arrays was how easy it was to set them up. Um, whereas in the past, I would have been used to you know uh, spending a lot of time um, talking to consultants about you know complex storage layouts. We would look at different disk types. We'd be looking at different array groups. How do we separate our log out? How do we separate out our data files? Uh, where do we want to put TempDB? And all this added up to taking a lot of time to deliver something uh, of value to the business. Uh, and and they, they really want really, <coughs> they, 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 where they just want to get on, they want to get service provisioned. Um, and, and really, in, in, with today's modern old flash arrays, uh, we can concentrate our time on adding value to the business. Um, not only are they fast and intuitive to provision, but they have a range of features that enable integration with hypervisors. Uh, you can integrate them with private clouds. Um, you can integrate them into various orchestration tools. Uh, they, have, they have REST API uh, support. You can script with them. Uh, really, really, really uh, allow for rapid delivery of services uh, to the business, really on your terms, which, which is what you need today, because that's what the business is demanding more and more wants storage provision quickly and it wants to be able to uh, you know, you know, get VMs spun up really, really fast uh, to, to meet changing, ever-changing business requirements. And <clears throat> sure, I think we're kind of running short on time, so we better make sure we go on to the next one there, Phil. Thanks. Okay, so these are just um, some uh, considerations that um, you know, if, you, if you're looking at an all flash array solution, and again from from an architect's perspective, um, you, you got to look at you know the big picture. Okay, what what do I have to plan out here? Okay, so if you think about things like um, <coughs> compression, um, so an all flash array will have compression. Uh, SQL has compression, but then if we implement uh, TDE, so uh, encryption is a really really hot topic these days. Um, does that limit the amount of compression that we get from SQL? Uh, does the array still deliver compression it, it, with, with uh, TDE? Does the array have compression itself? Why are the advantages and disadvantages of these? Uh, a question I often get asked is around fragmentation. Um, and 
because all flash arrays are, are, are really, really good at doing random I.O. as well as sequential I.O., do we really need to um, have index maintenance plans on our SQL Server database? Uh, my own advice uh, around that is yes, uh, we do, uh, but I think there's less uh, there are probably less cases for it. I, I probably need to run it less often. So what I would say is that if, if you're investing in an all flash array, what you probably want to do is review and optimize your maintenance plans to take advantage of these all flash arrays. And remember, uh, these all flash arrays, uh, because they deliver I/O so fast, uh, your maintenance windows will complete faster anyway, uh, <coughs> and, and, and spend less time interrupting any of your business processes. Um, and again, um, just uh, I, I, want to, uh, I, want, I want to talk about snapshots again here in, in the context of this. So uh, as, as I said in one of my previous slides, um, there's a lot of flexibility now around how you design LUNs. Um, I mean, you can put databases on one LUN, you can put databases on multiple LUNs, um, and again, you can, depending on your requirements, uh, it, it's, it, it's a lot flexible, it's a lot easier to do, and there's a lot less complexity um, when you go to design this. But there's also flexibility there. So uh, in the case of snapshots, uh, you might think, if for you, in your scenario, uh, you might think when you're designing your LUNs, hey, this time I'm going to design them with recovery in mind. So what I'll do is I know I'll need to repurpose these set of databases here, so I'll put these on a separate set of snapshots to allow me to do this. Where maybe some, some, where maybe some other databases I might have five or ten databases that I'll never repurpose. In those cases, I can make, might put them all together on one run. So it gives a lot of flexibility there. Um, again, um, for again, um, for always on, um, we can dedupe well, as Phil touched on earlier. Um, it will drift over time, um, especially on updates and deletes. Um, but um, I, 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 again, it's really, really fast to set up. It's really, really fast to initialize, and you will get a, a, a big safe saving in, in initially. Phil, do you want to touch on one or two of the other topics on those uh, on, the, on this slide? Yeah. So there was uh, there was recently a discussion about parallel I/O paths, and and somebody um, there was a a, a SQL consultant. Um, on, on one of the aliases I'm on who asked about, they, they found a five terabyte, an instance of five terabyte database on one physical device and they wanted to know if they should try to fix that or not, which is a really difficult problem. And a lot of people came back and said, hey, if you put these on really fast storage, it doesn't matter. You can have a single device. Um, but the, the, the problem with that and the problem with um, fragmentation, the problem with designing specifically for really fast storage is what happens if at some point you want to move that to another platform at some point. So this, this application was really hot for a while and now it's not so hot and we want to move this off of flash storage, we're going to put it someplace else. If, if you have tons of fragmentation and you have uh, a lot of data in a single file so that you know when you when you go on to a, a, a storage device with less uh, with higher latency you're going to get really bad performance you, you still need to even though you have if you're going to put your devices you're going to put your databases on really fast storage you still have to take care of them and treat them uh, well um, so that if you ever want to move them someplace else, you're not creating a, a bunch of problems. We, we, we all know that, you know, um, if you haven't striped your data across multiple files, it's really difficult to, to go back and do that. Um, so, so keep your best design practices. You know, if you would have done, if you would have done eight files on, on, a, um, on, a, on, a, on a typical storage device, Maybe you want to knock that down and say, well, I'm going to stripe across four files um, um, because then I can take it to another platform and, and I'll, have, I'll have better performance um, um, regardless of where I go. So that's the, the, the bottom line out of, out of this slide really is don't start getting too hung up on simplifying your designs simplifying your maintenance plans, simplifying your I.O. storage plans just because you have really fast storage. Um, try to find a balance there.
That's it. We okay. done? We're top of the hour anymore. We're close. We got a minute or two. Do we have any questions? Uh, we have a few questions. Hold on. Let me look at the screen here. So they have a question about the IOPS. They were wanting to know what are the size of the blocks that you for the IOPS that you were talking about a few minutes ago. Sure. Um, that was an OLTP workload. So a typical OLTP workload. Uh, when you started up first, you'll have some read ahead. So that would typically be 64K reads. Um, over time, it would tend to be more random 8K reads uh, for, for these old, for OLTP workloads. So once, once, once it had ramped up, it would be a lot, a lot of random 8K reads going on for those workloads. And that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's an artifact of these, you know, um, OLTP workload generators and, and testing tools. You know, the work that came out of the Transaction Processing Council and stuff uh, around OLTP workloads. So they tend to be, um, they tend to be smaller IOs. Tony, you've also done some work with uh, data warehouse-like um, um, workloads as well, right? Yeah, we, we, we have also tested um, data warehouse workloads. Um, there's a fast track paper out there as well uh, for, for all flash arrays, a, a few of them out there as, as far as I know. So again, um, the, all flash arrays will deliver sequential I.O., uh, large size I.O. Uh, re really quickly. Um, but I, I guess uh, it, one, of the, one of the real advantages is their, their ability to deliver random I.O. Re really fast to, um, <coughs> as well. Any other any other questions out there? Uh, well, we have one more, but I'm gonna hold off on that one. Um, I'm gonna mail it to us and take it offline because we're really running tight on time here. Um, okay. So I just um, at this point really want to thank uh, Phil and Tony for coming on today. Uh, I want to make sure we get that in there uh, for taking their time out and presenting this. Uh, I thought it was very informal, great information on flash arrays today. I learned a lot and. Um, we're going to be capturing this video on YouTube, and if you go to the SQL Data Architecture site, uh, we'll have a link there. Also on SQLTigers.com, I'll put a link there, and uh, you can probably find it if you type DAVC at YouTube. It'll bring up the Data Architecture chapter, you know, videos um, for our, you know, virtual chapter. And um, just one neat thing is that uh, I really wanted to point out. Um, um, today, I hope I said this right. Tony is from. Uh, it's amazing. Our is Ireland, right? Yeah, that's correct. It, it's, it, I find that amazing that we, we're we're crossing the continent to another continent for our chapter today. Uh, that's uh, I think a first. I mean, I've had people watch from Australia, uh, different continents, but never present. And, and to me, this is wonderful that we can get people from different continents to come together and talk about topics that we all find fascinating and can help us in our career. So thank you, Tony, and thank you, Phil, for uh, coordinating this. Thanks for having us. Thanks very uh, much, Rob. Thanks for having me. Yeah, really and, um, and, and I'm going to try and get them back later on with some more topics later in the year. If they're, they want to come back, they're welcome to. Um, and I'd like to thank everyone for watching today. So um, Tony and Phil, thank you, and I'm going to shut it down now, okay? All right, thanks. Okay, y'all have a great day, and um, it's thundering and raining here, so I hope the weather is better there than here. <laughs> Thank you.